Hi, this is Hall of Famer Eric Dickerson, and you're listening to the Harris Highlight Show. Enjoy it. Coming to you live from the Bill Austin Radio Studio at the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism in beautiful downtown Phoenix. This is Season 3, Episode 19 of the Harris Highlight Show. Joining me this week is our college football analyst, Josh Schaefer, with our executive producer, Lyle Goldstein, in the studio. And that's all we have this week, boys, because our well, our former, I should say former executive <laughs> producer, our other executive producer, Brady Klain, is currently on duty tonight taking photos for the uh, Arizona Hotshots. Now, I, I know for those listening, that just sounds like the worst excuse ever to be made out of getting out of the show. But no, there's actually an Arizona Hotshots football team for the AAF, as this lie just seems to be getting bigger and bigger. But no. On call. There, there, there is an actual Arizona Hotshots team for the AAF. We'll talk about later. But Brady's there taking photos for them right now. For who? We are not really sure, but he's there taking <laughs> photos right now. So it's just going to be the three of us this week, guys. Now, I think our last show we did, it was just myself, Lyle, and Brady. So uh, it's been, I think, over a month since we had the four of us together. So that's going to have to wait even longer because, Lyle, you're not going to be here next week. Wait, wasn't our last show together the, the award show? Was it? Yeah. Yeah, it might have been. It okay, was. so that was the last one. So we were together uh, not too long ago. But the three of us tonight... And there is actually a lot to talk about in the college football world, guys. Well, I'm just kidding. There's not really that much to talk about. But <laughs> let's talk about something that we've never really, you know, discussed into extent on the show before. And that is college football recruiting. Now, I know a lot of people out there, they are absolutely in love with college football recruiting. And for them, that's like the biggest part of the college football season is following high school ball to see who their teams recruit and overall how their team is doing now. It's kind of tough to really determine how teams are doing because unless you're like Alabama, every other ranking is completely different. Where Alabama, you just have 35-star recruits, and they, of course, win the recruiting game. But we're going to go off a few sites and see how teams are doing. But, guys, I'm going to ask you guys. Lyle, I'm going to ask you first as a Notre Dame fan. Growing up as a Notre Dame fan, how, how much... In, like, how much investment did you have into the recruiting, and how much did you really like analyze it? Well, of course you like to look at it. I mean, Notre Dame is historically a f- phenomenal program. They've gotten a lot of big-time names and big-time guys that have come through their school throughout the years. Joe Montana, I mean, probably the most notable, if you had to ask me, but, you know, Tim Brown, a Heisman Trophy winner. But as of late, when recruiting, like, really started to become a thing— I think they can still be competitive as long as they're usually like inside the top 20 or so, which they usually are. The problem with them is their academic standards are far beyond like almost all these other schools, notably in the SEC, where you go to a school like Alabama, LSU, you know, they're student athletes. They have much looser standards when you talk about what they have to do in the classroom, whereas at Notre Dame, you're like required to have a 3.5 GPA or else you're put on academic probation or, or you're put on uh, or you're pretty much ineligible to play football so I keep it you know in in rap I I mean I like to you know kind of stay on top of it and I always like to see them rack in good recruiting classes but I know it's never going to level up to some of these SEC schools so I always kind of say my line is as long as they're in the top 15 or so that's okay with me what about you Josh How, how closely have you followed SC recruiting throughout your life yeah, I mean, growing up an SC fan from Southern California, where, I mean, Southern California is a hotbed for high school sports, especially football. Um, so I, I paid close attention uh, close attention to it. I worked with the high school, or with my high school's team. And um, so, yeah, I mean, you pay attention to it, especially when you play against a lot of uh, top tier talent in high school, or you know people that do play with them. So you go out to games, and um, we used to. Uh, 
uh, our, my buddy Matt and I, I don't know if he's on the sh- he's ever been on the show with us, but my buddy Matt and I worked for, or we would get CIF, LA City Section credentials, and we would kind of manipulate them, go to Southern Section games where a lot better, there were more better teams in the Southern Section. We'd just cover up LA City pa- uh, on like on our credentials, and we'd get into everything for free. So we'd just go whenever, whenever our high school wasn't playing, or they played earlier in the day, or something like that, we would go out and we'd see all these other high school's games because it was fun going out and seeing uh, the type of talent that was out there. I mean, I, I saw Brady White, who was at ASU and is now at Memphis. Uh, Brad Kaya was a guy that we'd go see a lot. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I paid attention to recruiting, um, especially, of course, SC. And, you know, like like Notre Dame, SC is one of the top five college football programs of all time. So you expect um, good recruiting classes every year. And, I mean, for SC, it's not there right now. Uh, and a lot of people are blaming uh, Helton and the AD Lynn Swan. I mean, that's another story I don't necessarily agree with all that but there's a lot going on in college football and I think especially with some other teams that are continuing to recruit so well I think a lot of coaching changes at SC have kind of set them back quite a bit yeah I like what you mentioned it's always fun to root for your hometown guys and especially if they go to your own school Mm -hmm. for example like I grew up really rooting for Kavari Russell who was a Notre Dame corner he got drafted in the third round by the Chiefs now he plays for the Bengals he grew up in Everett Washington that was about 25 minutes from where I came from but even the guys that don't go to your favorite schools again you just root for the kids who lived around your area to succeed for me miles jack buddha baker went to our maybe not rival high school but you know they played within 10 minutes of us they're in our conference so i mean just because they're local guys again it's always fun to watch those guys and and hope for them to succeed because both those guys have had pretty successful careers up to this point and and michael thomas was before me but i mean blake's a saints fan michael thomas went to my rival high school yeah so that was a guy we get got to see a lot mike burkovici when we when we first came to asu burkovici had just wrapped up his time at asu he went to my rival high school too so it's kind of cool like seeing these guys and then if you ever get a chance to meet them and bring it up because then you have that kind of link in common so yeah I always like to root for the guys that were that were from uh, around my area especially once they're no longer at your rival high school anymore it's it's easy to root for these guys well I went to Arcadia High School where in the last 15 years our only claim to flame claim to fame is someone that walked on at UCLA so I unfortunately didn't have the privilege of seeing all these amazing, amazing recruits. However, though, Arcadia High School is home to arguably the greatest center in NFL history and Bruce Matthews, who is currently in the NFL Hall of Fame. I think I think he set the record for most consecutive games played, and yet he is mentioned nowhere in Arcadia High School. So really, one of the, one of the NFL's all-time greats is nowhere to be found at Arcadia High School. So anyone from Arcadia, California... You, you need to get on that. But, yeah, I, I, I never really was one to follow that much recruiting news because, like I said, my high school and my division wasn't one of the better ones, so there were never any of these top-tier prospects. But especially now, I'm really interested seeing, like, kind of where guys are from. Nowadays, it used to be the, the old kind of... It, it was wherever you were from, you kind of went to that school. Where if you were in the LA area, it was USC, UCLA. If you were in like the Florida area, it was Miami, Florida State. But now you got all these guys that are gone, going all over the place. Take, for example, the number one recruit out of Westlake Village going to Oaks Christian. He ends up at Oregon. So it just goes to show now that hometown loyalty is kind of a thing in the past. And the recruiting game has completely changed where guys, they just want what the best sell is going to be now. It's not about what what it was for them growing up, which is, I think, a changing game in this recruiting year. Well, I don't know if that's always the case. I agree that it's changed more so nowadays. I mean, just to use another example of my own, Savan Ahmed, who's probably going to be UW starting running back, who did go to my rival high school, he stayed local and, and went to UW. I mean, Buda Baker, again, another guy that went to UW. So there still are guys that stay at home and go to their local schools. But the guys that are that highly recruited, again, like a Kayvon Thibodeau, who's the number one recruit in this class, or like some of these guys in the top 15 to 20 that are five stars, you're right in that sense that hometown is kind of thrown out the window. It doesn't mean they won't attend their hometown school, but they're going to have to compete really hard with the Alabamas and the Georgias of the world. Yeah, and and Kayvon Thibodeau, a lot of people, especially out of Southern California, thought that he was going to end up at SC. And I I don't know if SC pulled anything off the table, but I think that they stopped recruiting him for a while I don't know if that was confirmed or not but I remember seeing something about that but I, and, I, and I didn't realize how important it was um, and how um, how unsuccessful it had been in the past but upon starting school at ASU I didn't realize how much of a struggle it had been for U of A and ASU to keep these homegrown talents in state so that's why one reason, I mean, we've raved about Nikhil Harry a thousand times on this show before, and uh, everybody else who does football shows at ASU does the same thing. Nikhil Harry was a guy that played at Chandler High School, 
And he was a homegrown talent, a basketball and football player. So he was one of those. I mean, they put up a billboard down the field or down the street at Chase Field that said stayed true with it and said, thank you, Nikhil Harry. Like, it, it's so big for these guys in Arizona to stay in Arizona. And now, something that they were talking about on ESPN the other day was USC and UCLA, especially with where the programs sit right now. Of course, SC will again be a college football superpower. They will get there eventually because they have been throughout history. UCLA, not obviously not a, a, a top 10 college football program of all time, but they have consistently recruited well in Southern California. And this year, they've been struggling to keep the really good players in California. I mean, you see Thibodeau from Oaks Christian. He's going up to Oregon. You see all these other guys that are going elsewhere around the country. You've got guys that are now, I mean, Alabama, everyone's going to consider Alabama, especially if you're getting an offer from Nick Saban. There are a lot of Southern California guys who have been getting offers from Alabama that are now heavily considering schools on the East Coast or schools in the Southeast, schools in the Midwest, rather than staying at home, going to USC and UCLA. And that is now becoming an issue for a lot of Pac-12 schools. I mean, some, something that USC had done in the past was they would take a lot of guys from Oregon. So I, I think now keeping players in state, especially for the schools on the West Coast, talking to you Pac-12 schools, this is something that has become an issue for so many Pac-12 schools now that they're really starting to take a step back and the conference has been, it's integ- not integrity, but it's really skill set has been called into question a lot lately over their two or three biggest sports. So I'm going to go right now. I'm going to look at, right now I'm on 247sports.com. I'm just going to list off what the uh, top 10 recruiting classes are as of right now. Uh, to no shock, it goes Bama at one. Then we got Georgia, Texas, Texas A&M, LSU, Oklahoma, Oregon, Michigan, Florida, Clemson. Now, out of those top 10 guys, is there anything in there that kind of like surprised you? It could necessarily be a team that is in the top 10, a team that's not in the top 10, where a certain team is. Um, I, I'm going to start off right now. I'm surprised to see Texas at three and Texas A&M at four. I, I, just, I guess it just goes to show that uh, Tom Herman and Jimbo Fisher are going a long way for those two schools in regards to that because nowadays the coach has a lot to do with it as well, not necessarily you know the facilities, the program's history. You got Texas, who the last few seasons, they've been kind of a disappointment. A&M, the last few seasons, they kind of haven't really gotten over the hump. But here they are at three and four over – Proven teams like, I don't know, in Oklahoma or a Clemson, I, I think that just goes to show a lot that uh, head coaches, especially nowadays, may be more important than ever. We've kind of seen that with Herm Edwards and the effect that he's had. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think you're right. I mean, like, I mean, you look at some of these schools and, um, and like you just mentioned, Herm Edwards, Arizona State, he just gets these three, four star quarterbacks that are all coming in as freshmen in Ethan Long, Jaden Daniels, and, and Joey Yellen. And those guys are all. Very highly regarded on most recruiting sites. Daniels and Yellen are both top 100 guys. So Herm Edwards, for example, you're right, is really, really turning around this ASU recruiting thing. Uh, For Texas, I mean, I'm not that surprised that they're doing well again. I mean, well, first off, they're back, didn't you hear? But um, for Texas, I mean, Tom Herman's turning it around. They just won a New Year's Six Bowl. I mean, I think they're really starting to figure it out down there once again. Similar to how Josh said USC will once again be a superpower in college football, whether that be in one year, three years, whatever it may be. Well, Texas had their downtime, and now I think they're really starting to climb their way back to the top. So I'm not surprised to see them that high. Yeah, and I'm not surprised either. Texas A&M, I I am a little bit surprised, but they've gotten some some really good commits lately. I mean, here's one thing that stands out to me, though. Alabama and Georgia at the top, that's, I mean, that's clear cut. I thought that was easy. Alabama has three five-star commits. What what's so surprising is that they have twenty-three four-star commits. Twenty-three. I mean, there are some schools that don't have twenty-three commits, and they have twenty-three four-stars. And I know there are a lot of people that have all their different rankings. I mean, Bama has three five-star recruits, and there are some other teams that don't even have any five-star recruits that are in the top ten. Florida doesn't have a five-star and is ranked ninth. Um, and I know, especially after you get out of number one and number two. I feel like all of the other spots are up for grabs for the most part, depending on which ranking you look at. So I know ESPN has their rankings a little bit flip-flopped, but um, for the most part, you get the gist of it. Um, I'm not really surprised with the top 10. I'm surprised with some of the teams that are between like 15 and 25. Um, And then there are some classes that I thought, based off of who they have, simply would give them a better ranking. But that's all kind of subjective. 
to yeah. be honest. And I, I was surprised to see Oregon so high. I mean, a lot of that comes from getting Kayvon Thibodeau, yeah. and a lot of that comes from getting— He's their only five-star, too. Right, and then they got this kid, Mikhail Wright, the corner from Lancaster, and— um, and he's the number 25 recruit in the nation, according to ESPN. So those two guys kind of bolstered their recruiting class and shot him way up the ranks. So I was a little surprised to see him up that high. But, I mean, Cristobal is supposed to be a fantastic recruiter. So, I mean, maybe this is just the start of something for the Ducks, too. Yeah. Now I'm switching over to uh, to Rivals.com. This one's kind of more fun because you can kind of categorize each one. Now, this one actually has Georgia ranked at number one over Alabama, but it's like, very close. I think if Alabama gets like one more three or four star, they're probably going to move on up. This one has Georgia, Bama, LSU, Texas, Oklahoma, A&M, Oregon, Florida, Clemson, Michigan. So essentially pretty much the same teams kind of just switched up a little, which I, I, I find interesting. All the different websites, how they differentiate each ranking, how like some players are different stars, how like they... Like, this is like a point system. Like, Georgia has 3,063 points. I don't know how they get those points. Yeah. But it's kind of exciting to see. Now, according to this, now this is interesting as well. Can you guys guess which two schools currently have the most commits? They, it, it's a very common theme. So Is you, it, I don't know, shot in the dark. Is it USC and Notre Dame? All right, that's your guess. I'll say Clemson, and I'll say TCU. Army and Navy. Really? Army currently 84 commits and a Navy 72. So I don't know if that's like in regards to future in a few years or so, but the next closest and third is Air Force with 44. Okay, well, well, some of, well there, there's a trend to this. Yeah. I mean, yes. I think this is – I was going to say, I mean, <laughs> yeah. there's no Army-Navy guys in the ESPN 300. They <laughs> commit because, I mean – Hey, Army com- does have, according to Rivals, four three-stars. Really? Mm-hmm. All right, that's not bad. I mean, coming off a of, – Ten, or a two-loss season, that's pretty good for them. And according to Rivals, the team that has the lowest amount of commits is Illinois, with only 13. Oh, that sounds goodness. about right. With Louisville right behind them. Really? Yeah. That would not have been my second guess. Nah, man, that Louisville program is just completely, ooh, what a, I mean, what they, a downfall. I mean, they had under. Lamar, they had Devontae Parker, they had Teddy Bridgewater. Like, what happened? Yeah, they left. <laughs> yeah, we're getting real close to the Q&A question of, which Power Five conference has the worst team in college football? Now, here's here's an interesting one right here. I go going over to the amount of four stars. We mentioned that Alabama had only three, or I should say, five stars. That Alabama had only three five stars. There are currently two teams that have four five stars. They don't have a guess to which which those those two teams are. Well, considering I have it up, I'm going to guess LSU and Oklahoma. <laughs> that's, that's a good guess, Lyle. Any guesses? Oh well, I'm looking at ESPN site, but can I go with Bama and Tennessee? Sure. We just said Bam only has three. Oh, okay. So, oh, you're right. You're right. So, okay, I'll go Tennessee and Clemson. Well, according to this, Josh does have it up. So Oklahoma and LSU both have four, five star recruits. With A and M, Alabama, and Georgia having three, Michigan, and Clemson having two, and then a bunch of random schools having just one. It's kind of fun. I like doing this. Alabama, no, to no surprise, has the most four star recruits with 21. Let's see with ooh. Now, and we, that and that's according to rivals because if yeah. we go, if you go over to uh, what were we looking at? We were looking at a twenty four seven before. Yeah. Over twenty four seven, they have twenty three. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Now, Lyle, this one I'm sure Josh has has this up as well. But I'm going to ask you. Now, th- this is a very shocking one. Who do you think has the most three star recruits? I'll give you a hint. It's a team in actually the top two are SEC teams, uh, but they're not going to be SEC teams. You think? Okay. Well, I'm not going to guess them the obvious ones. I'll go with Florida. And I'll go with Missouri. Per per rivals, Ole Miss is actually the number one with twenty five three stars. Okay, but Missouri's number two with twenty three stars. Hmm. And then you got Iowa with nineteen, Memphis with eighteen, Northwestern with eighteen. And I know this one really means nothing because three stars that could be a completely hit or miss. But it's interesting seeing how the teams leading the way, like Colorado, Cal, Rutgers. Like, all these teams have more three-star athletes than some of these powerhouse schools. But well, I guess that's because most of theirs are five or four right, stars. Right, and that's yeah. what some of these mid-tier uh, Power 5 teams have to do. They can't go after all these five-star recruits because they're going to get beat out. So they have to settle for going for some of these three-stars, hope they can develop them, and hope they really pan out one day to really build a sustainable winning program. Now, aside from the, you know, um, you know like the armies, the navies, the air forces— can you guys take a guess as to who currently has the worst recruiting class? The worst. Tulsa. 
I like that guess. Can you give me a conference? Oh, see this one, it's kind of going to give it away. No conference. Ah, uh, well, I scroll all the way down and say UTEP. It's it's not UTEP now. Well, but no, it's, based, so it's, it's, based off of yeah. average, it is the good old Brigham Young BYU. Cougars. Which is surprising because BYU usually has at least some good talent on their team. Yeah. They have wait. And when hold on, hold wouldn't on, you hold think on. that they could get us swayed by the idea of getting to drink Coke? Getting to drink Coke, having curfews, not be able to do anything on Sundays. That, that sounds amazing. It really what's, does. What's crazy to me is the fact that having rollerblading parties. <laughs> yeah, so so if you look Listening at to BYU and BYU and UTEP both have they're ranked as the 99th best recruiting class. In regards to this point system. Yes, in regards yeah. to the point system, they're tied with 825 points. BYU has 23 commits. They've got four three stars, no four and five. UTEP has 30 two commits and is the worst recruiting class in division one football not a lot of high profile guys i guess yeah but blake blake let me do the james franco and just back up here a second did you just say listening to kids bop for byu where does that even come from <laughs> well considering the fact that they can't listen to music with swear words i'm assuming they have to so you think they listen to kids, to bop? kids bop hey i think so hey our good friend garrett listens to kids bop <laughs> and he's not even mormon <laughs> Wait, so he does? He does. He was listening to a Kids Bop version of Thrift Shop by Macklemore not too long ago, and boy, was that something. But th- this is interesting. I mean, I like seeing all this because, as we've seen, I I think recruiting is definitely something you got to take a look at. But I do think it's overrated because we do see so many of these, these guys. Take, for example, Josh Allen out of Kentucky, who's going to be likely a top five pick, maybe a top three. And I believe he was a two-star coming out of high school and you see all these stories of all these like college yeah, look at football. Khalil Mack yeah all these college football stars that I, I think J.J. Watt may, was like a two or three star as well yeah. if I may be mistaken but um, it, the ranking doesn't define you so but it's always interesting to see and I always like the best part is all these recruiting videos now that these people come out with always something that's very exciting very entertaining now we kind of mentioned it earlier in the show i think josh may have it up on his twitter right now and i'm hearing some sort of like echo from my mic so i don't know if it's just me or maybe i'm crazy and there it is it's officially fixed um we're gonna talk about it's not really it kind of is college football related but we're gonna talk about this newest football league guys and that is the aaf which i believe is the uh, is it the alliance of american football is that the proper term for it so it's the alliance of american football there are currently eight teams right now we have a team right down the street playing at Sun Devil Stadium. So, guys, I'm just going to ask you and what your initial thoughts are on, one, the league itself, and, two, how it's been received so far. I like it. I like it a lot. Um, and I like that the cities uh, with AAF teams are not necessarily your biggest high-profile cities. And, and by that, I mean – and that's nothing against Phoenix because, obviously, the Cardinals are – 20 minutes down the road in Glendale. Obviously, Orlando is a populous city. San Diego used to have an NFL team. Um, But it's the fact that they're all in places, for the most part, that don't have NFL teams. And I like that. And I I like it a lot because now it can continue to grow football in different places that don't have professional football. And beyond that, I I kind of like their idea of trying to have some sort of year-round football so that once college football and the NFL end, then here's... Sorry, hey, ASU and the Cardinals are now done. Here's the hot shots. I like that idea a lot, but the best thing about the league is that all the players have opt-out clauses in their contracts because the league, I think, understands that they're not going to overtake the NFL. So they're just trying to become the stepping stone to the NFL. So to me, it seems like minor league football. Yeah, and I think that's a great system to do it. I was saying this to Blake on the car ride over. I think this league has a chance to kind of phase out the CFL because I think a lot of these players that were undrafted free agents coming out of college would go to the CFL and try to play there and maybe one day work their way back to the National Football League. Now I think the AAF is absolutely going to overtake that. All these guys are going to stay in America. All these guys are going to stay and play in this league because it's seems like it's it's really well done. Bill Polian's done a really good job with this whole thing. But for me, I mean, I think it's really fun because all these college stars, 
that didn't maybe pan out the way they hoped in the NFL have another chance to play, and people have a chance to see them on another platform. The guy that always stands out to me is Aaron Murray. I mean, Aaron Murray's a guy that was inches away from going to the national championship and beating Alabama back in 2012. He had a really good college career. He didn't really make it in the NFL. He spent a little bit of a, t- a little bit of time as a backup in Kansas City, but now he's playing in the AAF, and everybody's like, "Hey, remember Aaron Murray?" Remember that Georgia quarterback a few years ago? You know, he was inches away from a national title. Well, now he's playing in the AAF. Now he's, you know, he's back. He's playing again. Trevor Knight's kind of the same story, who's the Hot Shots quarterback. He was a stud at Oklahoma. He was a stud at A&M. I think it's cool to see these guys get back onto the spotlight a little bit and have a platform to play on. I, I absolutely love it. Now, I, I was talking with Lyle about this. I think the CFL is going to stay, but I think this is going to become more of a kind of like, yeah, like minor league system where you got these guys that – didn't necessarily make it in the NFL the first time, but you if you come out and you're balling, because the competition's going to be there. These are some good college football guys, but, I mean, Trent Richardson's in the league, so really how competitive is it going to be? Maybe he'll average more than three yards a carry this time. We're going to have to wait and see, but I I absolutely love well, it. two touchdowns today. This, this really? is his track uh-huh. back to the Hall of Fame. Remember back oh, in, yes. uh, I told you before the show, back in 2016, he said, my NFL career will end with my plaque in the Hall of Fame. I, I, I think it's absolutely phenomenal. Now, the rules, I, I learned about the rules yesterday. I kind of just assumed it was going to follow the same guidelines as football. Now, there are some interesting rules for those of you who don't know, where the first is they've essentially eliminated the whole point of kicking. They still have field goals, and uh, I think that's pretty much it, but they've eliminated kickoffs pretty much where everyone just starts on the 25 yard line and after every touchdown you can only go for two which i kind of like i think that's kind of fun you can only go for two i kind of like the whole thing about having kickoffs but i guess i think it was loud or someone's mentioned this yesterday it's not necessarily trying to be its own nfl league you want to kind of more protect the players and just have more where they can make the next step to the nfl so i don't mind not having kickers i feel kind of bad for the kickers that are on the rosters where they literally might have one or two times in the game they're actually needed but I, I like that one with the two-point conversion. Also, I guess it's, if you want to do an onside kick, you can't do an onside kick, but instead it's like 4th and 13, I think, or 4th and 12, where you pretty much have to get the get the uh, conversion in order to uh, get the ball. And I believe that might be the only... I, mean, I like that. I mean, I like yeah, those ideas. Like By the way, you know who's going to be forever down in AAF history to score the first points in AAF football? The uh, young Hoku. Yeah. He was, the, he was the Chargers' starting kicker last year. He missed two game winners in two weeks, and he got cut. Well, he's back. Yep. Young Ho's back. That's amazing. That that I, I saw, I think, Kurt Warner tweeted it yesterday. Like, everyone pay attention to whoever scores the first touchdown because that's going to be a trivia question like 30 years down the road. Well, okay, so he wasn't the first touchdown, <laughs> but, but he yeah, kicked a field goal. First, first official score. But I, I like it. I think there's also apparently like less commercials, less uh, TV timeouts. Well, I would to, hope in, there's less commercials. In order to speed the game up as well. So a- AAF... It's uh, it's looking pretty nice. Hopefully, we can get out to a game soon. It's just tough though because all of the Arizona home games are at 6 p.m. We do our show at like 6:45, 7 p.m. But luckily, in a month or so, they have a one o'clock game. So, well, I think we I think go. they go back and forth between Saturdays and Sundays. Though. Ah, yeah. So hopefully we can catch a game there. Now, I was on Bovada a few about a few days ago before the season started. By the way, if you're not on Bovada. Go use my referral link in the description below. You can sign up for Blake's bets going over there. Although it's the off season, you could still make some bets. You could bet on the AAF, which I, I was saying this yesterday. When are you not on Bovada? I, I was saying this yesterday. How can you have odds for a league where you haven't seen any sort of games yet? Because I want to mention the Arizona Hotshots are the current favorite to win the championship. Now, I don't know how you could come up with those odds. I guess you're just going based off of the team roster. But the Arizona Hotshots were the number one favorites to uh, win the championship. So if you want to go make some bets, links in the description below. And they're but up right now. Guys, hey, perfect. Way to start the they're, season. They're 1-0. up 19-8 to eight over Salt Lake. Now, speaking of Bovada, guys, I'm currently on the uh, prop bets kind of section right now for Bovada. So we're going to have some fun here, guys. One of these ones right here is, what will Rob Gronkowski do first when he retires as an NFL player? So I'm going to list off. They have about 10 uh, what uh, he's going to potentially be up to. The favorite right now, guys, is that he's going to fight in a sanctioned WWE match. That could be something. The next is an NFL sideline reporter. A Monday, nope. A Monday night football announcer. Make an alcoholic beverage commercial. Make another Tide Pods commercial. Make a Zubaz commercial. Zubaz? Zubaz? Do you guys know what that is? No. Zubaz? 
act in a movie. Actually, that's actually yeah. the that's actually the current favorite. Yeah. A barstool sports employee, male Sports Illustrated swimsuit model, and my ultimate favorite at plus five thousand. A 2020 presidential campaign. <laughs> so, Alcoholic beverages commercial. I was going to say, so Lyle, if I had, if I gave you a hundred free dollars to make a bet for what Gronkowski's going to do after he retires, are you going to put it on the uh, alcoholic beverage one? Yes, and maybe Barstool too. But what about you, Josh? You know, I think act in a movie. I feel like he's going to be John Cena. <laughs> he's just going to turn into John Cena, or John Cena would play Gronk in, in the <laughs> in the Tom Brady movie that's going to be made. John Cena is going to play Gronk. <laughs> Gosh, well, that's a fun thing. So head on over to Bovada. There's a, there's a whole bunch of other kind of prop bets right now. I mean, I, I could go on and on about those, but those are the only ones that are really sports-related. So let's cr- try to transition now into some other college football-related news. Guys, my uh, Heisman favorite from this past season is taking his talents to Southern Methodist <laughs> University. Do you like this move for Shane Bouchelle, Lyle? I do, because you can't really win a Heisman sitting on the bench. No, you can't. Um, <laughs> But for him, I mean, SMU kind of had a tough year last year. There were five and seven. Uh, they're probably in need of a quarterback. And Shane Bouchelle, I mean, he had a really good freshman year when he stepped in for Texas. Of course, the team was a little bit up and down, but he showed some flashes of, of real promise back in that freshman year in 2016. Last year, he split time, and then this year, Ellinger just straight up took over the job. But for Bouchelle, I mean, he can still play. And if he wants to go to a place like SMU, which isn't too far from where he's already at, I think this could be a good fresh start for him, and he's gonna, you know, he's gonna get a chance to start. So yeah, I like the move. Yeah, he's staying in the same state. He's only going about two and a half to three hours south, so or north, I guess, from Austin. Um, but yeah, I, I like the move. I mean, it's gonna give him an opportunity to play, and I think that uh, I think that SMU could maybe turn things around with him at, at the helm of the at the helm of their offense. Excuse me. Um, and I think it's one of those moves that you're kind of going to see with a guy like Brandon Wimbush going to Central Florida. I mean, Central Florida's that UCF had a good year, obviously. Um, but then you get a, a relatively high profile quarterback who's no longer in a starting role, and there's a big opportunity. So, I, I and I think that Shane Bouchelle is one of those guys that fell kind of off the radar, especially when you had so many different guys like Kelly Bryant, Brandon Wimbush, and other, and, uh, Hurts. And yeah, Jalen Hurts, Tate Martell, guys that were going to be, uh, you know, transferring, looking for starting roles at high profile programs and flying underneath the radar, Shane Bouchelle, who can go down to SMU and can, uh, hopefully not, but probably very quietly turn around their offense, turn around the SMU, uh, team a little bit and turn around his collegiate career as well, because he started out hot at, at Texas. Yeah, I mean, he he had some really good games at Texas, but then, you know, Ellinger comes in and steals the job. So, and he, I, th- I believe he's eligible immediately, which is good for him because, again, these these rules are all over the place where, with who's eligible, who has to sit out. So he's going to go to SMU. Um, I mean, I'm not too familiar with how SMU is going to look this year. Well, they do but... not have the death penalty anymore, so that's good oh, for them. Yeah, yeah, they had all those sanctions going on. It's amazing yeah, they had ruin Cor- them. It's yeah. amazing they had Cortland Sutton at one point. Yeah. How he ended up there. I wonder what, wonder what ranking he was. Now, th- this was something I was kind of just briefly mentioning with Josh. Now, I want to talk about this now. This whole Trevor Lawrence situation, because everyone's kind of already locking him in as the number one pick. I believe our friend Brady said that he was the best quarterback in college football last year and that he could enter the draft this year or something. <laughs> I, I was about to I, say. I forget what exactly it was, but Trevor Lawrence, everyone's already locking him in for not the number one draft pick in 2020, but the number one draft pick in 2021 because, you know, of the whole you have to be there for three years thing. So we kind of saw this, what was it now, three or four years ago with Leonard Fournette, where he started sitting out the season. Now, obviously, with two years to go, it's, I think, too early to be talking about this. But when you're Trevor Lawrence, when you're as good as he is, and likely barring some, you know, like Matt Barkley-type injury where you kind of just fall off the map, he's likely going to be a number one pick, maybe top five, easily number one quarterback of his class. How early, and should he start considering potentially sitting out? I know maybe next the following next season, but this season at all, I mean, do you like want to take any chances with him, or what do you do if you're in Trevor Lawrence's shoes? Uh, well, first no off way. with Burnett, first off with Burnett, he never sat, but there were rumors of like reporters and analysts like to, liking to pitch ideas on their talk shows saying, Burnett's so good, should he just sit? So he never actually sat, except for his bowl game. But in terms of Trevor Lawrence, look... Like I'm, I'm somebody who you guys know. I think first round picks should always sit out of bowl games. I think players trying to, you know, help their stocks, you know, don't take the risk and play in that last game in order to secure your spot in the NFL draft or or whatever. 
to sit out two years, that is way, way, way too long. And I, I think anybody who's pitching that idea is just kind of ridiculous. I mean, you can't just not play football in real live games for two years. And end up, I mean, and maybe he'd still be a number one pick, but I guarantee you his production would go down if he straight up didn't play for a couple of years. So for Lawrence, I mean, even, even in his junior year, sure, he can sit out his bowl game unless they're not in the playoff. I mean, sorry, unless they are in the playoff, he can sit out his bowl game. But to, don't sit out a full season of football. Don't even sit out half a season of football. I mean, that's just going to derail where you're at as a quarterback because there is something to playing in live games and seeing real competition. If you just don't do that for 12 months, you are going to be a different football player. Yeah, I, I think sitting out, especially this year, is silly in itself. I mean, I could see like if they're more lenient with him and for, for precautionary reasons, but the, we haven't really seen this in a while where you got a guy where pretty much after his freshman season, you're kind of like banking on him to be a number one overall pick. So I, I, it's, it's an interesting situation to be in for Trevor Lawrence because he's, he's got to have in the back of his head how he's already won the national championship. He's already proven what he can do. But now like he's just one hit away potentially from ruining that. So like, do you think he's going to, I mean, there was that one play earlier in the year where he like got a bad concussion because he tried like making a first down. Is he going to like, you know, take those plays off? Is he going to be kind of more casual with it? I mean, if you're him, like what do you do? Because you do like, I, I, I don't think he's a guaranteed lock, but he's, he's pretty close to being a 100% sure shot for being the number one quarterback in two years already taken. Yeah, but I, I think it's absurd to suggest that he should start sitting now. Yeah. I mean, and, and I know that when people are like, oh, start sitting, I don't mean sit every game. I, I, I don't think it matters. I mean, if you're sitting every other game two years before you enter the draft, I think that's ridiculous. And I think that, I think that if he were to start sitting every other game, even in his – even in his last season at Clemson, I think that would be too much. If you want to play, like, Bama always does this. Like, okay, you're going to go from LSU one week to a bye week, and then we're playing Mercer in week nine. Sit him, right? Yeah. Sit him. Um, but if it, like, sit, sitting every other game, especially in conference, and that's the thing is in two years – I still expect Clemson to be one of the top five teams in college football, at least consistently, right? Like, they're consistent. They have been for the last five years. So why is there anything to suggest that they're not going to be there in two years? So if they're there in two years, I don't see a reason for them to sit out a bowl game either. Right. And, and, and for Blake, Blake, my thing is, like, this is a little bit different, but what I talked about with Kyler Murray early in the year, where I worried with him that he was just the number nine overall pick in the MLB draft— is he going to be cautious, or is he going to sit out of game or games or plays during the football season because he's worried about his baseball stock? Well, he didn't, and he ended up being completely okay. And that's the thing about this this whole idea of sitting every other game or whatever it may be, is these injuries can happen at any point. It's unfortunate to say, but these injuries can happen at any given play, any given point in the game. So... Does it really make a difference other than maybe your body starts to get tired toward the end of the season, which is every football player, and then you rest up before the combine or whatever? Again, my take on it, do not sit any of the regular season. You want to sit your bowl game if you're not in the playoff, your junior year, yeah, I mean, I guess even your sophomore year. I can live with that a little bit more, but sitting in the regular season is, is yeah. a no-go for me. I forget where it was, but I mean, I, I know I... I think during like the after the play, I remember people were talking about like what should Trevor Lawrence be doing. I mean, he's going to be a guaranteed number one pick. How should he approach this? But I, I forget where I saw it where someone suggested he starts sitting as soon as this year. But I just want to know what your guys' thoughts were on necessarily that for just players sitting in general, especially when they have such high upside. Where you know injuries can happen at any time. It could be any kind of injury. It could be a freak accident. So who knows? But that was that. that I thought that was going to be an interesting topic for discussion. Now. Completely forgot to mention some of these. We're getting a bunch of Twitter mentions. Pretty much, long story short, everyone is so far in love with the AAF. We have about six or seven mentions so far. Everyone's just falling in love with it. I guess someone was talking about how there was like a catch rule with a replay that they got spot on. We didn't even talk about that poor hit on, on Mike Brickovici. That was Let's an, just ignore it, please. Th that would have gotten an NFL player kicked out of the league <laughs> had, he, uh, had he made that hit. And it was just a clean play, which I thought was absolutely phenomenal. So the AAF is it's looking good and going back to the recruiting from about 20 minutes ago everyone a lot of people follow the recruiting they think it's a, a massive thing now this is something i had in the notes i forgot to ask you guys so we're going to go back to it before we move on to the q a if you're being recruited so let's say someone's recruiting you guys for a, for a new uh, college football radio show what is it going to take like for you as a student 
what what would it take for to for you to be recruited over? Would it be like the head coach? Would it be facilities? Would it be like the stadium, the fans? I'm kidding about the college football. Like I'm, now we're college football players. What would it take for you to be recruited? Five hundred thousand dollars, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think the facilities would be a big part um, to see where you'd be working at every day and who with every day. And I think another big part of it is the coaches and what they really believe in their developmental plan for you and for the team. So I think those would be my three things, the facilities, the coaches, and then on top of the coaches, their pitch on how badly they want to win and how they plan to do so. And if they sell me, I'm all game. Yeah, I agree. I also think location would factor into it as well. I mean, and I'm not saying like, oh, I don't want to go far from home or I don't want to be on this side of the country. I just want to see what, you know, what what is the what is the lifestyle like? What is the environment like around campus, around the stadium, around the facilities? I think that'd be that'd be interesting too because I mean, if there's not much to do other than other than football, for me that would be something that, you know, I I wouldn't want to be in that environment. And that's not to say that I wouldn't focus on football and I'd rather be doing something else. But when you're not focusing on football, I want to do more than just relax and play video games or watch other teams play football on TV. You know, I think there are a lot of things that factor into it. But, yeah, I think the big three would be facilities, coaches, and, and, and what type of role they would expect me to be. What is that pitch going to be like? Something else I would – I like those those reasons. Something else I would take a look at is kind of like what position I am, what the depth chart looks like because if I'm going, I want to start – I want to be playing. I get like if you go to like a team like Clemson or Florida or whatever, you got to sit for two or three years to finally get your start. Like I get that's great winning and all, but I want to play. So I want to go somewhere where I'm going to be. Not I don't want to say guaranteed, but it's there, there's going to be a likely chance that I'm going to be like now. If you're a quarterback, I can kind of understand like maybe waiting a year or something like that because it's just so limited. But if you're like if you're a wide receiver, if you're a running back, if you're on defense, I want to be playing coming in, or at least I want to have an opportunity where I know I have a chance to play. Well, even if you're a quarterback. I mean, if you're that highly recruited, for example, Justin Fields, who briefly, if we want to touch on it, is now eligible to play this upcoming year at Ohio State. When he committed to Georgia, I mean, I'm pretty sure Eason was still there when he committed, and Jake Brom was definitely there when he committed. So for a guy that was the number one recruit in the country, that was a little interesting to me to say, okay, he's looking at the depth chart. Here's two established guys. Oh, I'm still going to go here. But like you said, I mean, I think that plays a huge factor into do I think I can play? Because you're right, I wouldn't want to be sitting if I was a, if I was a player. Yeah. I would want to go and play. Like, well, That's a fun thing. So if you're listening to the show, what would it take you to get recruited by a school? Now, would it be your dream school, Regis, you know, say, okay, I'm in. Or is it going to take a little more than that? So hit us up on Twitter. I haven't even mentioned our Twitter yet. Make sure to follow us on Twitter at the HH Show underscore. Guys, a few questions for our Q&A before we wrap things up. Now, this one, I I haven't really paid any attention to next year's college football schedule. I don't really know who's playing who. This one, I did not know this was happening at all, and I think this is going to be fantastic. Lucas McKnight wants to know, what are your thoughts on the Oregon versus Auburn rematch? Week one, but possible winner is a playoff dark horse. Now, obviously, this is going to be a rematch of that national championship from just a, a few miles down the road. What was I think was that was 2010. 2010. So that was nine years ago already. I remember. I forget. Was it Michael James where he was like down, but he was never like touch, and he like ended up running like 30, 40 yards when there was like a few minutes left in the fourth quarter. I think. Do you so. remember that play? Yeah, I, I'm just trying to remember. I if can't it remember was if it was Michael James, James or not. James. Auburn ended up, I mean, that was a very historic Auburn season with Cam Newton, one of the best you know seasons we've seen as of late. Oregon couldn't get over the hump. But a rematch, essentially nine years later, well, I guess it's too early to do our, our pick per se, but one, are you guys excited for the rematch? And two, do you think whoever wins this game has a chance to potentially be a playoff dark horse? Yeah, I, I think, uh, yeah, I'm excited for the game, but in terms of playoff dark horse, I, I'm, I'm not too sure yet. Um, obviously, Oregon's got the good recruiting class. Thibodeau's going to be a big-time recruit. And I think, obviously, with Herbert coming back, that's huge. And Cristobal has already established himself as one of the uh, as a prime candidate for um, potential Pac-12 Coach of the Year, especially if the conference is still kind of trying to pick up the pieces of where they were a couple years ago. Um, so I, I, like, I like Mario Cristobal a lot. Do I think they're a dark horse? No, I don't. I'm not. I'm not totally sold on the Ducks yet. Um, and I know, yes, it is February, um, so we do have a lot of time. You know, 
the season might come around, preseason football during the summer, I might notice a couple more things, and I'll be picking Oregon to win the conference. And right now, I already think that they're probably going to win the North, but I'm not totally sold on them from a from a national standpoint, so I'm not sure. And then for Auburn, I think that there's a lot of different teams that could potentially be standing in Auburn's way in their conference already. So as of right now, I'm excited. I'm not entirely sold on either of them really being playoff dark horses. I, I think the game will be exciting. I, I know my like closest friend is excited to go down to this game in September because it's in Dallas, I believe. Yeah, which uh, I'm, I'm bummed about because I, I, I just looked it up and I was hoping that it was going to be um, a home and home between the two. So it was like this cool. game is going to be at Austin and then Uh-oh. in a year it's going to be in Jordan here, but it is in Arlington, which I mean, I get it. It's cool because you could pack 90,000 people there, but I'm just not a fan of those where it's on a neutral site where let's be real. This place is going to be 80, 85 percent Auburn fans. Yeah, but sometimes it gives the Oregon. fans. Sometimes it gives the fans a chance to travel, which Very some true. some of the fans like. But how awesome would it be to have an Oregon Auburn game at Austin? That would be cool. I'll, give, would be I'll give the Pac-12 that. Um, the game will be exciting. Auburn might get their first their first look at Bo Nix, who's the second dual or the second pocket passing rated quarterback in the country. He's like a top thirty recruit on ESPN. We'll see if he wins the starting job. If he does, we'll get our first look at him then. Um, for Oregon, I'm with Josh. I'm not really sold on them being a uh, playoff sleeper as of right now. I mean, Dylan Mitchell, Dylan Mitchell, their best receiver, he just left for the draft, so there's going to be some questions in the receiving core. Justin Herbert, we'll see if he bounces back from what was a little bit of a down year this year. So Oregon, like I said, I think they'll be one of the better teams in the Pac-12, but for the playoff, I don't know. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that'll that'll be interesting to see. But that, that's going to be a, a good week one matchup. One, one of these upcoming shows we do, we're going to have to do, like, the top 10 best, you know, games upcoming for the 2019 college football season. Something like that. Because I, I, want, I need to take a look at what kind of week one, week two matches we got. Because we've had some good ones the last few seasons. Here's one right here. I'm going to just, from Dylan, Dilly Bar 2145. Now, this could be very open-ended, guys, but who might be one of the sleeper teams that can possibly be in contention next year? I'm going to, I'm going to start one. I'm going to throw one out. I I really like Florida. I really like what they've been doing the last few years. They they got us one of, the, I think, the, the, the most slept-on quarterback, running back duos, especially for next season, I think. Um, defensive wise, I, I think they're up there in regards to the best in the SEC. I, I like Florida. When I saw this question, for whatever reason, that was the first one that came to mind to me. Wait, do you mean Felipe Franks, like quarterback wise? Yeah. Really? Uh, let's and see. Then, well, then with P. Ryan coming back for his senior season, which by the way, I don't think he's related to Samaje P. He's Ryan. Not. I don't think he is, but I, I don't know. I, I like that duo. I like Felipe Franks. Well, Michael P. Ryan, I like Felipe Franks until he proves that he can actually take the next step offensively. I'll... I'm yet to be sold. Florida's defense is outstanding, and it always is. For me, sleeper team, man, it, it is, it's tough to say, especially at this point, because there's so much that's yet to play out. Um, I mean, it's, if you call Texas a sleeper at this point, I mean, I think they could easily make a run with Ellinger coming back, with Colin Johnson coming back. Um because Johnson is staying, right? Is that did he? Colin Johnson, yes. Yeah. Um, so I think that's a team that you could that I could see taking that next step next year after getting so far this year. But if you call them a sleeper, I would I would go with the Longhorns. See, I like Texas too. Te- Texas is my pick, but um, I-, I completely agree with Lyle about Florida. I-, I like Florida a lot, but I'm just not sold on Felipe Franks yet, I and mean, that's. Uh, and it's not. I don't think it's a bad thing. I just haven't seen you know necessarily what I've seen from. Sam Ellinger at Texas. Um, I think that the that the cap, uh, that he's entirely capable of leading Texas to a potential playoff berth. Obviously, they've got to get through a couple teams in conference. Number one is Oklahoma because I think they're reloading, if not getting better. So uh, I think that's one thing to to watch out for, especially for Texas. But um, I, I think Florida's getting there, but I do think that there are better teams in the conference, and I don't know if Florida's defense is going to get them past all those teams. Florida just seems like every year they always have like two or three guys that are just guaranteed like top two round picks, where just they they just rotate it. But I mean, Felipe Franks, I mean, he threw for twenty five hundred yards with twenty four touchdowns and six interceptions. I mean, that's no Heisman level caliber, you know, stat line right there. But it's it's not bad. No, and it's especially not. this season, I mean, he's definitely going to improve on that. And I don't know. I, mean, I, I think it's somewhat decent, but I, I like Florida 
as as well hey maybe tennessee will be back this year josh okay so that's <laughs> another thing though too is i'm not sold on tennessee obviously being a playoff contender or a playoff sleeper but i like what they've been doing they have a top 15 recruiting class i mean kind of depending on where you look but for the most part i'm gonna say they're top 15 are we cool with that all right we got a top 15 recruiting class for tennessee they're bringing in t martin who's a fan favorite there not a big fan. Of, uh, you're a big fan. Of not his, necessarily aren't you? at USC. I think he's, I, th- I think he's a phenomenal recruiter. So depending on what his role really was with their recruiting class, that might be something. I mean, they already had a good recruiting class before he was hired. I mean, what like a month ago or something like that. But I mean, he is a fan favorite in Knoxville for obvious reasons. I mean, he won a national championship with him. Um, so. Uh, I, I like the hiring from that standpoint. For a team like USC, I, I'm glad that they parted ways with him. I think he's a phenomenal recruiter, but I think the fit is better for him at Tennessee. So I, I, I like. I mean, I don't know if it was a joke or not, but I kind of like Tennessee. I think they're going to get back to where they were. Um, may, I don't want to say a couple years ago. They were decent a few years ago, and I think they'll be at least 8-4 and four this year. So, Lyle, I think, as I mentioned earlier, you will be unable to join us next week. So it looks like it'll be just Josh, myself, and Brady – from the Bill Austin Radio Studio next week. So, Lyle, good luck on your call next week for, I think it's baseball he's doing, if that's the case. Why don't you just do your plug right now for it? Oh, I, I'm just I'm just calling some baseball next week, that's all. <laughs> just a, <laughs> a subtle plug. How humble. I like that. <laughs> all right. Well, from the Bill Austin Radio Studio, this has been Blake Harris, Josh Schaefer, with our, I think, brand-new executive producer, Lyle Goldstein, because he did quite an amazing job. Well done, Lyle. Thanks, dog. Well done. Well... <laughs> and Josh is just going hard right now. So we appreciate you guys listening. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at the HH Show underscore. Leave a comment below in regards to any of the topics which you want to see discussed in further episodes of the show. In a few weeks, we're going to be starting our conference breakdowns. Complete conference breakdowns, which are going to be some good stuff. And we got some interviews lined up with some 2019 NFL draft prospects. A lot of great content coming for the Harris Highlight Show. You don't want to miss it. So as always, again, thank you for watching, and uh, we will see you guys next week.